How will D Dylan Cease, Kyle Wright, Andres Jimenez, and many other 2022 breakouts follow up this year? Let's find out. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Monday, January 9th. Frank Sample joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, we're firing up the repeat o meter, something we've never done before. But we're doing it for popular 2022 breakouts, and we'll get our thoughts from these gens on whether or not those breakouts can repeat this upcoming season. And speaking of repeats, Scotty, will your Georgia Bulldogs get it done on Monday night? Well, that's why we're podcasting here on Sunday night <laughs> <laughs> for a little peek behind the curtain. Um, I hope so. Semifinal game was tense and kind of miraculous from the perspective of a Georgia fan. I'm sure Ohio State fans were crestfallen, but uh, but yeah, it was exciting. Of course. Scott, do you ever say swear words when you're watching sports? Like, do you get like like ten? I'm sure you get tense, but I just want to know if like that's because I assume you're you're not a person who ever says swear words. Do you do you say a swear word when something bad happens in your favorite sporting events? No, I don't. <laughs> um, and as a general rule, I don't. No. Um, I, I curse like a sailor, whether it's whether it's a team I care about or not. Well, I, say, <laughs> I think you don't want to see me watching Knicks games because it gets pretty bad around here. Yeah, I, I think you guys are in the majority as far as that goes. But no, I don't. I was and, and you know, it was it was funny. I was telling you guys and I tweeted about this at the time. But um, during that semifinal game, uh, you know, to be honest, I thought. You know, Georgia's just rolled everybody they've played all year. Uh, we were on the road, as I talked about. We were driving back from visiting my family in Georgia. This was on New Year's Eve. And uh, I didn't have an easy way to watch the game. I'm going to be staying in a hotel room with my family that night. So I was just like, whatever, I guess I'll miss this game. And then I see they're losing at halftime. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I, like, scramble to figure out a way to watch it on my little tablet. And I'm, like, <laughs> huddled on the hotel bathroom floor while my family's <laughs> sleeping on the other side of the door. And I'm t I keep telling telling myself, you know, because I'm exhausted. I've been driving all day. We're going to Legoland the next day. And you I'm like, if they go down. for Legoland. It, I'm, if, if they go down three scores, I'm just going to call it. I'm just going to bed. And, uh. They came really close. They, you know, 14, I think, was as much as they trailed by in the second half. But I was able to see the comeback, the one point win, the missed field goal at the end, the, uh, the Ohio State uh, cornerback slipping for the 75 yard touchdown pass. A lot of things went right for Georgia that day. But, you know, hopefully. Hopefully they can get it done against TCU too. And hopefully it won't be quite as, um, I'll be fine if it's as dramatic, frankly, that'd be even better. But in the end, a win of any sort would be grand. I mean, you're, you're spoiled now. I am. And it's like, you know, you've, you've seen two championships in your lifetime. What more do you need? Well, yeah. I mean, the Braves in 95, the Braves oh, three, in three. 2021, Georgia, the 2021 season, January of 2022. And now hopefully Georgia can get it done two years in a row. Wow, Scott, you're you're basically a Yankees fan, man. I know <laughs> at this point. Uh, anyway, no right to complain again ever <laughs> about my sports teams. Uh, let's get into it. Of uh, normally we do news and notes in the middle of the show, but there was a lot that happened this weekend, so I think it it's only right to start there, and then obviously we'll get into uh, some of those breakouts from last year again. Will they repeat this upcoming season? Uh, and let's start with the news and notes. So we got some heavy news on Sunday night as White Sox closer Liam Hendricks has been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and will begin treatment on Monday. Obviously, this is much more important than fantasy baseball or you know, even real baseball. Like we're, we're talking about someone's life at stake here. Um, and obviously, we're hoping for the best for Liam Hendricks. The White Sox did mention that they won't have an update before opening day. Uh, so as we learn more, as they tell us more, we will obviously let you know. But that's the latest on Liam Hendricks, and uh, we're rooting for you. So you know, hopefully everything uh, works out well for for uh, for Liam Hendricks. We had a trade over the weekend as well. Gregory Soto and Cody Clemens were sent to the Phillies in exchange for Nick Maton, Matt Veerling, and Donnie Sands. Uh, Gregory Soto last year, 30 saves with a 3.28 ERA. However, the whip was very high, 1.38. Uh, the strikeouts, the swinging strike rate, 
We're both down considerably year over year, uh, and the control has been bad for years now. Scott, there's a lot to unfold with this trade, but uh, I, I guess there's seemingly no value anymore for Gregory Soto, and it looks like Alex Lang could step in as the closer for the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, there's no way Soto's going to be even the first or second choice to close on a team with Craig Kimbrell, uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez, Jose Alvarado. So, and and it's not like he brought much to the table ratios wise. So yeah, just forget about Gregory Soto. Uh, Alex Lang does appear to be the running favorite to inherit Soto's role, role in Detroit. I've seen that from fantasy analysts, and I've seen that even from a Tigers beat writer uh, saying he was the presumptive favorite. You know, a lot of times we give, uh, when it comes to team decisions, we give beat writers more, um, you know, we, we find them to be more trustworthy. But I took this as speculation on his part as well. I don't think this is coming from AJ Hinch. Oh, now Andrew or Alex Lang is our closer. Um, he does have closer stuff. Two, I believe I saw he had two pitches with a swinging strike rate of 25% or better, which is not something you see very often. 11.7K per nine last year. It's pretty wild, though, which was a problem for Gregory Soto, why we considered him a worrisome closer. You know, the overall numbers for Alex Lang, 341 ERA, 1.23 whip, in addition to those 11.7K per nine. And, I, and I, led the majors in wild pitches. There you go. Season. Yeah, I mean, I was watching some video of him. It seemed like it, the sort of pitcher where, you know, he he releases the ball and it just goes wherever, you know, <laughs> like he has no idea where it's going. Uh, and A.J. Hinch, I mean, really any manager these days, I, I don't think you can. Um, it, 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 he, he seems like somebody who might go the committee route for somebody this unproven. So I guess what, what I'm trying to say here is um, Gregory Soto, while he wasn't a closer, we felt comfortable with in fantasy. He was allowed to get 30 saves last year, and I'm not as confident Alex Lang will be allowed to do that. Uh, probably more upside overall than Soto, so I guess you're probably drafting him in about the same spot, but I, I don't think he's a slam dunk to get the first save for the Tigers or the last save for the Tigers. All right, that is Alex Lang. Last year, he pitched in 71 games. Scott mentioned the ERA and the whip. 19% swinging strike rate for Alex Lang, but 4.4 walks per nine. So again, does struggle with control quite a bit. Chris, the return for this trade, mostly depth pieces for the Detroit Tigers in return. Uh, Matt Vierling, I think, remains somewhat intriguing still. He makes a good amount of contact. His average exit velocity, 91.2 miles per hour. That's the 86th percentile. He's really fast. His sprint speed is 97th percentile. Uh, he does have the splits thing going on. He's much better against lefties than he is against righties. I don't think there's anything there, but I guess if there's a name just to pay attention to in deeper leagues, it's Matt Veerling for me. Yeah, like the, like you said, the skill set is somewhat interesting, but the production across both the major and minor league levels has been incredibly lackluster. So I'm not expecting much more than AL only relevance for him. All right, the Dodgers officially designated Trevor Bauer for assignment on Friday. They'll pay the remaining $22.5 million on his contract. Bauer then released a statement that said he met with the Dodgers leadership last week, and they told him they wanted Bauer to pitch for them this year. Not really sure what happened, who's right, who's wrong, whatever. Uh, but as of now, Trevor Bauer is a free agent, and we'll you know see if another well, team... Will be a free agent in five days as of right now, or... They can still, they have five more days to trade him. Okay. Yeah. Before they have to release him. Yeah. So DFA for now, and then we'll, we'll see if any other team wants to jump in on Trevor Bauer. Fernando Tatis Jr. has been cleared for baseball activities. He underwent shoulder and wrist surgeries in September and October, respectively. Uh, he'll also miss the first 20 games of the season due to suspension. But, you know, Scott, this is pretty inspiring i would say for fernando tatis you know i i guess he's you know not really going to be limited in spring training at all and you know, maybe when the 20 games is up the suspension he's just ready to go that would be the best case scenario obviously yeah. and i i don't think it was uh, something i was necessarily counting on uh certainly if we're seeing and i mean it's kind of where we were with ronald acuna at this time last year right if we're seeing him play in spring games and he looks great then he's going to rock it up draft boards and you know, probably, 
I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he ended up being a first round pick, like a late first rounder when all said and done, he's being drafted more like, uh, you have his ADP. I, I have him ranked more like a late second rounder. I can say that for Fernando Tatis, but it wouldn't uh, surprise NFC, me. It's 21.5. Sorry. Okay. So that's, you yeah, know, about the same. Yeah. Um, so wouldn't it surprise me if that happened? Interestingly, that happened with Acuna, even though he wasn't playing in spring games. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I guess in, with 2020 hindsight, we could say that backfired on the people who uh, who moved Acuna up draft boards. Uh, but it, Tatis, obviously a different case, and um, you won't be able to stash him in an IL spot while you wait for him to return, which is unfortunate. Yeah, but best in baseball upside just like acuna and, yeah. and the nice thing is you know it's only 20 day, 20 games right like something if he, could if go he's, wrong and he gets hurt but you know it, it it right now it's just 20 games right well yeah i mean if the rehabilitation continues um it, as it sounds like it is then yeah yeah and i've said this once i'm probably going to say it a lot more times before we get to spring training before we get to the start of the season fernando tatis is probably one of if not the biggest wild card in fantasy baseball right now, because if he is healthy, ready, good to go after 20 games, looking to prove something, chip on his shoulder, whatever you want to say, then again, he could easily be the best player in fantasy baseball. Or you know, if he's dealing with injuries, he, he could miss a ton of time once again. So there's a really wide range of outcomes when it comes to Fernando Tatis Jr. This season. AJ Pollock signed a one-year, $7 million deal with the Seattle Mariners. And last year, he hit 245 with 14 home runs and a sub-700 OPS. Chris, now 35 years old for AJ Pollock. Uh, roster Resource has him penciled in at DH with Julio Rodriguez, Teoscar Hernandez, and Jared Kelnick in the outfield. Any interest, I guess, deeper leagues in AJ Pollock to Seattle? Not really. I mean, your your 15 team leagues, maybe he's worth a late round dart throw, but it's a park downgrade. It's a bad park for hitters. We saw, you know, Jesse Winker was really harmed by that. Obviously, you know, AJ Pollock's not a left handed hitter, but still it just it's not a player that I think is worth getting excited about at this point. The Carlos Correa saga continues. Andy Martino of SNY reported that the Mets have grown, quote, very frustrated in their negotiations with Correa, with one source with direct knowledge saying that they could walk away from negotiations. Uh, and I saw another report that other teams have been in contact with Correa once again. So just a really, really weird situation all around. We don't know where he's going to play, position-wise or team-wise at this point. But once we know, we'll let you know. The Padres made a few small signings this weekend. They signed former top pitching prospect Brent Honeywell to a one-year deal on Friday. Uh, Honeywell has been derailed by injury after injury only through 20 and a third innings in the minors last season. They also signed Adam Engel to a one-year contract. The repeat o meter Can these breakouts do it again? One through 10. Uh, one being, we do not have much confidence in the breakout performance last year. Don't really trust it. Not expecting anything close once again. 10, we have the utmost confidence in this breakout. Doing it once again in 2023. And Scott, we will start with one of your Atlanta Braves, Michael Harris, who finished 56th overall in Roto. He averaged 3.2 fantasy points per game. The National League Rookie of the Year, 297 batting average, 19 homers, 20 steals in just 114 games. He was awesome. There are some troublesome or, I guess, noteworthy things under the hood when it comes to Michael Harris. Where are you at on him? Breakout, O-meter, 1-10. Yeah, this is a tough way to calibrate it right from the start here, um, mm. because I have I have doubts about Michael Harris. Obviously, uh, y you could make the case to draft him as early as round two. I have him kind of going right at that round two, three turn in roto leagues anyway. Uh, because I mean, you just project out his numbers. I mean, it's it's first round numbers. It's five category production, power, speed, batting average. But he has this profile that I really hate. Hardly old, hardly ever walks, less than 5% of the time, and a ton of ground balls, 56% ground ball rate. It makes you wonder how he was able to uh, produce so much power, especially when you know looking at the minor league track record. Not a lot of home runs hit down there. Now, the scouting report said more power was to come, but he wasn't hitting for much power there, and he hit ground balls at a very high rate in the majors. So did he overachieve? And then you look at the breakdown, kind of slumped to the finish. Uh, 
because he didn't have a full season's worth of at bats, it, it, it makes it it makes it harder to know if we saw the full trajectory of a season for him, or if he was just insanely hot for a couple months and then kind of tailed off to, to to something more sustainable at the end. So uh, all of this is to say, um, while I have my doubts, I would still invest at least a third round pick in him in a Roto League. So I'm going to say on the breakout meter, that puts Michael Harris at about a seven. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, I think that makes sense based on the analysis there. Uh, Chris, Scott mentioned some of the things, the ground ball rate. Uh, I think the splits against lefties, again, we need mm-hmm. more of a sample. I know normally you need at least a 1,000 plate appearances against you know both righties and lefties for these things to kind of normalize. But last year, a 238 batting average, 649 OPS against lefties, chased a lot of pitches. Uh, the whiff rate was 26th percentile in baseball last year. Where are you at on Michael Harris, the repeat o meter? breaking out again in 2023 um yeah i mean like like scott said the you know the uh, calibration is tough but you know if I, I guess a five like I, I think there's a decent chance he repeats it because we're talking about a young player you know a very young player 21 years old um who is clearly on the upswing he's clearly developing he took a step forward last season in the minors before getting the call but i don't like i think he definitely overperformed you know, from from his underlying numbers to, you know, what he actually produced, like most of it suggests that he was, you know, lucky to have an 853 OPS. However, there's the, you know, 21 years old, what he did, the way he, he took the majors by storm, the way he, you know, posted even, you know, showing the underlying numbers not backing up what he did. The underlying numbers are still very good, you know, above average quality of contact, um, Strikeout rate that's manageable, you know, 24-ish percent. So I, I think generally speaking, like second, third round is probably right for him, even if I think he's probably going to be worse on a per-game basis than he was last season. All right, let's move on to a pitcher who's actually going in a similar range as Michael Harris right now. Dylan Cease, who finished 28th overall in Roto, 2.20 ERA, a 1.11 whip. 227 strikeouts were the fifth most in baseball last year. A true breakout, throwing his slider way more than ever before. Use it 43% of the time last season. Chris, we'll start with you. Dylan Cease, the repeato meter. How likely is it again in 2023? Uh, he, he's another one where I think he'll definitely be worse than he was last season. I think he was probably pretty lucky to have a 220 ERA. You know, you look at the left on base rate, 82%. Uh, the the underlying stats, you know, XERA, FIP, they were good, but they weren't, you know, arguably the best pitcher in baseball good like like Cease looked like. And, you know, you look at the the strikeout rate and the walk rate, and actually both were slightly worse than they were the year before. He had a, a much better quality of contact uh, profile. And so that makes me think that there's definitely going to be some regression because quality of contact is one of those things that takes a long time to stabilize. It's not clear how much of, you know, the improvements that he showed in going from a 383 expected wove on contact to a 313, which was one of the best among any starter, you know, that's the kind of thing that like it could be for real, but we probably need a bigger sample size before we can say, yes, Dylan Cease is an elite quality of contact suppression guy. So I, I would say probably a four, I think he'll still be very good, but I think the ERA is probably going to be closer to 350 than 220. So, you know, it's not it's not just burying him, but I do think that there's certainly a lot of room for regression. Scott, something I noticed about the second half for Dylan Cease as well is that both the swinging strike rate and the K per nine were down considerably compared to the first half. So second half, 13% swinging strike rate, 8.7 K per nine. So a little concerning for uh dylan sees where you at repeat o meter on him following up his 2022 breakout so i think chris's calibration of the repeat o meter is a little uh harsher than mine and so i i don't know if i don't know if you should compare mine like i, I don't know that you should compare our numbers to each other yeah so well i mean i'm taking it like own, five you know? is five is he's as likely to repeat as he was as he is to not i guess i don't know these are arbitrary numbers maybe i need to make it a lot harsher then 
Uh, okay. So anyway, Dylan Cease. Yes, I I think he is. He, frankly, I'm looking at where I have him ranked and thinking I don't really feel good about Dylan Cease in that spot because I have him ahead of Shane Bieber and Alec Manoa and Spencer Strider, who I know his ADP is even higher. Uh, and I'm I'm looking at all of them and thinking. I like these guys more than Cease. Ton of strikeout potential from Cease, obviously. He also made, led the majors in walks, and uh, that is an easy way for a power pitcher to beat himself, is just issue free passes. And I do think he had quite a bit of luck. I mean, in addition to what Chris mentioned, uh, Cease had a 14-start stretch with a 0 0.66 ERA, which in itself... Like that crazy and unsustainable, and the big reason why he finished with a 220 ERA overall. But during that stretch with the 0 0.66 oh, I ERA, this. he had, let me count them up here. Uh, da, 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 da. He had 10 unearned runs. Yeah. So six earned runs, 10 unearned runs. And, you know, obviously that's pretty weird and unlikely to happen again for Mr. Cease. Yeah. So, to put a number on it, all right, let's lower Michael Harris to a six, okay? Okay. And then I'm going to go five for Dylan Cease. All righty, fair enough. Uh, Dylan Cease right now, the early ADP is 35. He's the fifth starting pitcher off the board over at the NFBC. We know lots of uh, upside for Dylan Cease with the strikeout potential, but, man, that price tag does seem pretty, pretty high when yeah. it comes to Dylan Cease early on. Let's move over to another hitter, a first baseman here, Nate Lowe or Nathaniel, as he's referred to on fan graphs. Finished 57th overall, uh, but surprisingly just 2.7 fantasy points per game. He was more aggressive last year. He didn't walk as much, so I think that's why you see it reflected in his point per game average. He hit 302 with 27 home runs. Oddly enough, the counting stats were not great, just 150 runs plus RBI. Big jump in OPS year over year from 2021 to 2022. 771 and then an 851 OPS last year. Scott, we'll start with you this time. Nate Lowe, big breakout in 2022, the Rapido meter for 2023. I think it's probably like a four. I'm, I might go lower even. <sighs> I, I think I think Nate Lowe is fine. I, I, I would be okay with him. Uh, being my starting first baseman, but few players have the capacity to hit 300 year after year. And so, I mean, if we're taking it from the literal perspective of will this guy repeat his numbers, I don't think Nate Lowe will repeat a 302 batting average. I think the high BABIP, the overall batted ball profile suggests he's more like a 280 hitter, which is still pretty good. Um, he had 27 home runs. You know, that might be the high mark for him as well. Uh, but I think it's possible he could do it again. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with four. I, I don't think he's... We're, I, I don't think his 2022 numbers were, you know, just radically off base. But I, I do think they were probably his career best season. And he's more, more like a mid-tier first baseman. Chris, Nate Lowe made some tangible changes last year. He lowered his ground ball rate from 54% to 48%. He crushed left-handed pitching, 330 batting average, 920 OPS, and he was much more aggressive. He was uh, swinging the bat more. He was chasing pitches a little bit more. And normally we don't love those things, but overall it, it helped Nate Lowe break out last year. Uh, where are you at on him, the Rapido meter for this season? Yeah, I mean, the thing that really sticks out is how good he was against lefties. He went from pretty even splits in 2021 to a 920 OPS against lefties versus an 817 against righties. Nathaniel Lowe is a left-handed hitter. Yeah. So that is usually not what you see. And he went from like a 120 ISO against lefties in 2021 to a 206 uh, in 2022. And that was really where he stood out. Like an 817 OPS against right-handed hitters, that's fine. And if he, he, he did that against both-handedness, he'd be a decent player, but probably not. You know, uh, I think he'd be a fringe starter for fantasy. And I, I think that's probably where he ends up is like a low 800s OPS bat. Um, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I just think he probably did, you know, run a little hot last season. What's curious about Nate Lowe is, you know, the batting average, the home runs, 
beyond our expectations, obviously, mm -hmm. 302-27, like I said. Even with that, and even playing 157 games, getting nearly 600 at-bats, he only had 76 RBI. He yeah. only had 74 runs scored. So I could see a scenario where that batting average and home runs, they go down to the extent we're expecting. And yet, just because he has better run and RBI luck, and more help from the supporting cast, he ends up having a more productive fantasy season overall. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really well, well said, Scott. Mm -hmm. I was going to say something similar where, you know, the steamer projection has Nate Lowe for 271 batting average. His XBA last year was 275. So if he hits 270 to 280 in the middle of, you know, an okay Rangers lineup, I think at least the top five or top six should be pretty good in that lineup. Then, yeah, I think he probably should be closer to, you know, 85 runs or 90 plus RBI, something like that. So some trade off with the batting average, but hopefully some more counting stats coming for Nate Lowe. Let's go back to your Atlanta Braves, Scotty. And Kyle Wright was a huge breakout last year, 44th overall in Roto. He averaged 17 and a half fantasy points per game. That was tied for 10th among starting pitchers, mostly because he led baseball with 21 wins. He was the only 20 game winner last season. Former first round pick finally put it all together. 3.19 ERA, 1.16 whip really leaned into this curveball, which fueled the breakout. Scott, we're coming right back to you. The rapido meter on Kyle Wright uh, following up this breakout in 2023. So I think the, the breakout was legit. We saw much better control. The curveball he threw harder. Got a lot more swings and misses with it. The ground ball rate was, I'd go so far as to say elite, 56%. Oh, yeah. Um, we are entering a period where ground ball rate might not be as beneficial as it was but um overall i i think kyle rate uh, kyle wright uh can sustain a lot of what he did this past year but he can't repeat 21 wins i don't think like the only the majors only 20 game winner and there was only one 20 game winner uh last year too like that's the braves may be great but it's still very very unlikely kyle wright gets 21 wins again so I would suspect that falls by who knows how many five, 10, like he could have, he could have a really good season all around and have 10 fewer wins than he did last year. That's I mean, just the nature of wins. Max Fried through five more innings had an ERA nearly three quarters of a run lower and won seven fewer games. There you go. There you On go. On the same team. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and I, you know, just looking at the ERA estimators, it's more likely than not that ERA is going to go up from 319 than down. So uh, if we're, if we're treating this uh, repeato meter by the letter of the law, I guess I'd have to go like three on Kyle, Wright. But the thing is a lot of that regression is already baked into his price tag. And so yep. I imagine I'm going to draft a lot of Kyle, Wright. And speaking of that price tag, he's currently going at pick 118. That is Kyle, Wright, Just ahead of names like Luis Severino, Nestor Cortez, who we'll get to in just a little bit, and Hunter Green as well. Chris, I mentioned the uh, the curveball fueled the breakout here for Kyle Wright, a 211 batting average against on that pitch, a 15.7% swinging strike rate. The control was much, much improved compared to what we've seen in years past. Uh, how much do you trust it, the rapido meter, on Kyle Wright? The, the profile generally looks pretty good if he can repeat the, the skills from last year. So, I, you know, my initial thought when I was thinking about, about Kyle Wright for this season was, yeah, kind of a, like, good pitcher, but not a great one. I don't know how much upside there is to tap into beyond what he did last season. And there's that walk rate from, you know, the minors and prior to last season and the stints that we'd seen where I think there's some real implosion potential there for him. And so I was going to say I'm out on Kyle Wright this year, except, I, you know, you look at ADP on, on NFC and he's 117. Like he's right ahead of Luis Severino and like literally basically the exact same price as Hunter Green. And so it's like, oh, no, I'm probably going to draft a decent amount of Kyle Wright just because that yeah. that price tag, even if I don't think he's going to repeat it or even if I think there's some risk that he doesn't, uh, I don't think there's any more risk with him than there is with Lance Lynn or Nick, Nick Lodolo or Hunter Green or other players going in that same range. So I, I'm I'm perfectly fine with Kyle Wright. I think there's like the likeliest outcome is he probably repeats most of what he did except the wins. And, and I, I've uh, 
you know what what we were just saying about Kyle Wright. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of reason for skepticism. He repeats those numbers. Maybe there's some implosion potential, but the price tag is so modest. And this is something we've talked about: just how sharp, how sharp the fantasy analysts and really fantasy players as a whole have gotten in recent mm-hmm. years. It's it's hard to, um, it, like you're not going to find many people who pay full value for a guy with with these kinds of question marks Mm -hmm. uh and and not just kyle wright who's probably the the most trustworthy of the ones i'm about to mention but also i look at martin perez i look Mm at uh merrill kelly um guys who had great years but coming into this year i'm like okay i'm not i'm probably not going to draft them because it seems like they overperformed but like everybody seems to recognize they overperformed in which case Okay, the value is not bad. I might end up drafting quite a bit of them just in case they can come close to last year's production. It's really this is something that I've, I've talked about a lot with both fantasy football and fantasy baseball. Is like it's very hard to find obviously over or undervalued players anymore. Like when we do like yeah. sleepers or breakouts or busts, you know, especially sleepers and breakouts, which are busts, which are more value driven. It's it's really hard to find guys that are very obviously under or overvalued except for Gabe Davis in football this year. (laughs) Uh, Last point on Kyle Wright. And this is something that the Welsh and I spoke about when we did our new year's fantasy baseball resolutions, obviously for 2023, Uh, Rob Silver did a fantastic presentation at first pitch, Arizona, basically pointing out, and this is going to sound so obvious that the most wins in fantasy baseball come from pitchers on good teams. It's like a really obvious thing, but sometimes I think we overthink that as well. Kyle Wright, pitching for one of the best teams in baseball, just had 21 wins. Doesn't mean he's going to repeat that, but, you know, he's as likely, um, you know, as... I, I, I'd be surprised if, so he had a, if he had a sub-350 ERA and didn't get double-digit wins. Right, yes. exactly. Yeah. But it, it, it's like the range is probably like he could have a 330 ERA and probably have a range from 12 to 18, and I wouldn't blink at any number in that range. Right. And all, like Ian Anderson had one fewer win than Spencer Strider last year. Wins are wins are kind of stupid <laughs> for the reasons we all know that I think we can agree on. Let's move on to another hitter here. Brandon Drury, who signed with the Angels this offseason. He finished as the 60th overall player uh, in Roto Leagues last year. Three fantasy points per game. He hit 263 with 28 home runs, 87 runs scored and 87 RBI. The problem is that Brandon Drury was much better with the Reds, who obviously have a great ballpark to hit in in Great American uh, Ballpark, who have by far the best home run park factors, according to StatCast. But for what it's worth, the uh, Angel Stadium has the fourth best home run park factors. So, Chris, we'll start with you this time. Brandon Drury, the Rapido Meter, 2023. I, I think it's probably a one or a two. This is definitely the lowest of the ones. I mean, we're talking about a player who's been in the majors for, what, eight years? and had never done anything close to what he did last season. That's not to say that there's nothing there, that he can't repeat it. But, you know, 915 OPS in Cincinnati compared to, you know, an 8, what, 15 overall. It's it's very hard to see that repeating. And, you know, moving away from Great American Ballpark, as we saw last season, was very bad for him. I don't want to say there's no chance that he can repeat it, but I'm I'm very, very skeptical of it. I've been working through my positional ranks and I've got Brandon Jury buried right now. I mean, I'm basically giving this guy no chance, which doesn't feel fair, you know, considering the season that he just had. But 242 XBA last season, uh, StatCast says that he would have hit 23 home runs if he played all of his games in Angel Stadium. So 240 hitter, 20 to 25 homers, like, you know, I, I guess that's okay in a deeper league, but it just wouldn't really move the needle much for me. Scott, the Rapido meter or brain injury this season. Yeah, I'm also going to go one here. Um, Chris Chris gave part of these stats already, but 298 with a 915 OPS at Great American Ballpark, 240 with a 746 OPS everywhere else. And you look at Drury's career prior to last year, prior to that stint in Cincinnati, and it looks more like the everywhere else guy, the 240 with the 746 OPS. He is going about 200th overall. On That's another NFC. thing, yeah. And he's triple eligible, first, second, third base, the two weakest positions. So, um, like, like he's going behind like 
Harrison Bader and like he's going behind Cody Bellinger right now. So it's one of those ones where it's like, again, I don't think he's going to do it again, but I don't hate the price. Yeah. I mean, if he plays every day, let's say, you know, if he hits 240 with a 746 OPS, exactly. That's probably not going to justify that pick. But if he hits, I wouldn't be that 260, bad at second base though. Two, yeah, two sixty. I mean, it'd be usable at least. Yeah, it'd be it'd be kind of a fringe waiver why I guess. And if he if he ends up hitting like, let's say his, I don't know exactly what it'd be, eightieth percentile outcome. Let's call it two sixty batting average, with twenty home runs or so. I mean, that's that's going to be a useful fantasy player, uh, particularly if you're talking about a big roto league like they typically play in NFBC. Um, and you know, it's worth saying since we've been citing ADP a lot for these players this the early adp pet data we're seeing on this particular site nfbc might be among the sharpest players it's skewed in other ways too it's it's skewed toward upside uh but it, it might be skewed toward uh intelligence and maybe not intelligence is the right word but <laughs> but you know what i'm saying it's skewed yeah. toward people who really invest a lot in fantasy Sharps. baseball yeah um, yeah savvy so point. So when we get more ADP data, when we get the ESPN, the Yahoo, the CBS even, we might see guys like Drury Wright, uh, Martin Perez, who I mentioned. We might see them going higher than, than we're talking about right now. But for now, the price tags seem reasonable for them. All right, let's take a break. Before we do that, just a reminder, if you're watching us on YouTube, to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Tap that little notification bell so you know every time we go live or drop a new video. Uh, and just a reminder that moving forward in the month of January, we're going to have three podcasts per week. Uh, most of the time, they're going to be uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night streams. But this week, we're obviously going live on Sunday. We'll also be live on Tuesday and Wednesday nights as well. If you haven't already, please follow our TikTok channel at FBT Pod, where we cut up a bunch of clips from the Full Length Podcast. We throw some highlights over it. We have some fun with that. So again, follow us on TikTok at FBT Pod. Let's take a break, and we'll be back right after this. We need a pecking order inside, gentlemen, so we have control on the outside. Mike, it's going to be some payback. I have an idea. It's going to stink, but it will work. I'm going to trust you on this. The inmates are running the assignment. Giving up the key. This war is what I'm trying to stop. If I say I'm gonna do a thing, I think it's done. All right, let's get back into the Rapido meter, taking a look at some 2022 breakouts and how likely it is for them to repeat this upcoming season. We're jumping back over to a pitcher in Nestor Cortez, who finished 53rd overall in Roto, 16.7 fantasy points per game. He has now made 42 starts since the beginning of the 2021 season. During that time, a 2.61 ERA, a 0 0.98 whip, 266 strikeouts, over 251 and a third innings pitched. Chris, we're coming to you. I know last year, first couple of weeks, first couple of months, there was some skepticism on Nestor Cortez, but it seems like maybe he won you over a little bit. Uh, what, where is your rapido meter on Cortez this season? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's tough about Nestor Cortez is that the thing that he does best, and it's not to downplay, he is actually a pretty good strikeout pitcher, but the thing that he's done best in the majors is quality of contact suppression, and that's the one of the skills that takes the longest to stabilize. But, you know, we do have, you know, 650 play, you batted balls against him at, at the major league level since he got to the Yankees over the past couple of seasons where he's been very, very good in that regard. So I think it's fair to assume he'll continue to be above average, and we've got two seasons of him being a pretty good strikeout pitcher as well. So, yeah, my skepticism has mostly gone away. I don't think a 240 ERA is, is all that likely, but, like, a 3-2 ERA, I think that's – perfectly like I, I think he's actually pretty similar to to Kyle Wright in a lot of ways a better strikeout pitcher which is not necessarily I think how most people would think about them but I, I think he's likely to be a, a low three ZRA guy who wins a, a decent amount of games with that team so I five or six you know a pretty good you know, no seven a pretty whoa. good chance to repeat oh yeah yeah, whoa. yeah whoa. let's do it I thought, yes. I thought I was we'll, 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 gonna shock the world by giving him a five. We'll pull a not. classic fantasy baseball today and and go with the Marco Estrada comp. 
<laughs> well, it, it's it's. I I understand the 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 way you were comparing uh, Nestor Cortez to Kyle Wright, uh, but in a way, they're they're opposites. Um, with the advantage going yes. to Nestor Cortez because Nestor Cortez good at uh, low quality of con- allowing a low quality of contact as you pointed out but not only that 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 low quality contact is mostly in the air mm-hmm. when and, and when you're allowing weak fly balls particularly in a post juice ball league those are easy outs uh, in, in a way that ground balls aren't as easy outs, uh, particularly if, if shifting is going to go down. So uh, I, I think Nestor Cortez has a better chance. I mean, obviously, he only won 12 games instead of 21. But even taking that out of the equation, I think he has a better chance of of maintaining than Kyle Wright does. I and mean, you look at his expected ERA, even that was 270. Yeah. So and I'm going to say five for Nestor Cortez. I, I, feel, I, I feel pretty good that this is more or less who he is, you know, maybe give him an extra 15, 20, 25 points on the ERA, but you're still talking about a really good ERA in that scenario. And, uh, and the price tag for him seems pretty reasonable too. Scott, did you give a number on the yeah, five? five? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm Chris giving out a seven. There's only one response that we can, uh, that we have for that. Oh my good goodness gracious. Oh my goodness gracious. Indeed. Let's talk about Andres Jimenez who finished 63rd overall in Roto last year, 2.8 fantasy points per game coming off a career year. Now entering his age 24 season last year, he hit 297 with 17 home runs, 66 runs scored 69 RBI and 20 steals. Scott, Obviously, the power and the speed is great. You'd like to see more counting stats if we can get Andres Jimenez to move up the lineup a little bit for Cleveland. Where are you at, Rapido meter on Jimenez this season? I mean, I, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go the cop out route with a, a five, just because I'm, I'm really not sure what, what to make of Andres Jimenez. He outperformed all his expected stats. A lot. Uh, the quality of contact is. Not that great. Um, but he nonetheless hit nearly 300, had a near 2020 season as a 23-year-old at the weakest position in fantasy, no less, second base. So we certainly need for him to be about that good. And given how young he was, I mean, it stands to reason the skills are still improving. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I could see it being just a total fake out and Andres Jimenez ends up disappointing everybody who invests in him to the same extent Brandon Drury does, but I'm, I'm feeling optimistic here. I'm going to, I'm going to give him a five, give him at least a 50% chance of repeating what he did. Chris, Andres Jimenez, if you look at what he did last year, kind of reminds me a lot of Nathaniel Lowe in that he crushed lefties as a left-handed yeah. batter as well. 336 batting average, 887 OPS against lefties, but those expected numbers do leave a lot to be desired. 297 actual batting average, 257 XBA uh, with a 466 slug and a 400 X slug. So, you know, those things you don't really love to see for Andres Jimenez. Where are you at? The repeat meter for this year. And if you dive into the the underlying stats for the for the splits as well, the sp- specifically the handedness splits, uh, he had a 336 batting average against lefties, a 250 xBA with a, th- a 385 x slug. So there was a massive difference between what the quality of contact metric, which was 80.3 mile per hour average exit velocity against lefties, and what he actually did. So that's one that I think I'm pretty skeptical of it. I'm going to say a three for him. Mm. All right. Well, that is Andres Jimenez. The early ADP is 86 as the seventh second baseman off the board. Kind of a tough one to project this upcoming season, um, but we'll have some more time. to. Yeah, uh, I think to, I'm going to be out on him at that price. To, to deep dive Andres Jimenez. Let's take a look at Tyler Anderson, another signing by the Angels this offseason who finished 58th overall in Roto. 257 batting average, a 1-0 whip on the nose, uh, but his underlying numbers... Not as good. A 411 FIP, a 404 X FIP. The expected ERA was still very good at 3.1. Uh, Chris, I'll come to you here. 
to start us off with Tyler Anderson. Uh, he leaned into his changeup, which was an elite pitch. It was awesome. But we know typically the Dodgers just work their devil magic and get the most out of their, their pitch, really all their players. But obviously their pitchers have been great the past couple of seasons as well. Uh, where are you at, Rapido Meter, on Tyler Anderson this season? Yeah, this is one that I think does highlight the quality of contact metrics because, you know, FIP and XFIP and, and all those stats – mostly assume a fairly static uh, quality of contact part portion of it. So they're mostly assuming most pitchers don't have that much control over their quality of contact that they allow. And the strikeouts and walks are mostly where pitcher quality comes from. And, you know, we know that that oversimplifies things, but generally speaking, most pitchers do pitch to their FIP and XFIP. You have to, you know, take a big leap with Anderson because he was elite in terms of quality of contact metrics a lot. 313 expected Woba on contact. That's been good for his career. It's been 349, and I think you probably expect some regression there. But, you know, it's it seems pretty unlikely that he's as much of an outlier in terms of the quality of contact metrics he allowed. The Dodgers had really good uh, quality of or, or overall numbers with runners on base, especially last season. I think Anderson, Arias, and... Uh, Tony Gonsolin were top three in Woba allowed with runners on base last season or something wild like that. So I think there's a lot of regression coming, but, you know, I, I think he can be a a decent pitcher, but not someone that I, I particularly want on my fantasy team. So I'm going to say a, a two. And for what it's worth, we know that there will be a shift ban this year. The Dodgers led baseball with 52.2% uh, shift rate. So... Yeah. That was the highest in baseball. They also had the most total shifts in baseball last year. So they're obviously a really smart organization. They put their pitchers in a position to succeed. Uh, and that's why we've seen a lot of their pitchers um, outperform their underlying numbers, as Chris highlighted there. Scott, Tyler Anderson, a 256 Babbitt last year was clearly an outlier, uh, 287 for his career. But again, if he can maintain some of these gains in limiting hard contact, and that obviously explains a, a lower BABIP and a lower batting average against uh, where you at repeat meter Tyler Anderson now with the angels. So I'm, I was going to go to as well uh, because, you know, kind of similar to what I said about Kyle Wright, who I gave a three, like I could see, I could see Tyler Anderson following through on the changes he made in 2022 and still being a much more effective pitcher than we know we knew him to be prior to 2022 because the Dodgers smart organization, as you point out, they altered his changeup grip and it, it became an elite pitch. Like the bottom just drops out of that. And while it's possible that he's now no longer under the oversight of the Dodgers, he'll just lose that. I think more likely that's something he knows how to do now and he'll be able to keep doing it uh, and, and be an effective pitcher. But he is a 32 year old soft tosser little margin for error there uh, and the numbers were just so good that it's it's hard to imagine him repeating them especially now that he's with a worse team uh, plus he'll probably be part of a six-man rotation now so the starts will be less frequent um having said that kind of like with kyle wright like even though i don't think tyler anderson can be what he was in 2022 nobody does and so nobody's drafting it I, I, one of our, we've only done two mock drafts so far. I mean, we have a lot more coming, but so far we've done two. And I think in one of them, I got him with my very last pick mm -hmm. in a 12 team league. A guy who had 15 wins, a 257 ERA, and an even one ERA last year. I got him with my last pick. I mean, that's, I'll do that in every draft if it's possible. And it seems like you might be able to, at least based on early ADP, 271 is the price tag for Tyler Anderson. So again, people are just not buying into, anything really of what they saw from Tyler Anderson uh, last year. And he is coming at a big discount uh, so far in early drafts. Let's move over to Anthony Santander, who finished 71st overall in Roto 2.8 fantasy points per game. That made him a top 20 outfielder on a per game basis in points leagues. He hit 240 with 33 home runs and 89 RBI career year for Santander really just managed to stay healthy. Uh, he's been a productive player in the past, but he's really had trouble staying on the field. Santander makes a lot of contact. He hits a lot of fly balls. So he's going to have a lower batting average, but the power uh, does seem pretty legit 
when it comes to him. Scott, we'll start with you this time. Uh, Santander, the Rapido meter of the season. I'm going to go... I'm going to go three, between three and four, 3.5, let's say. But my skepticism isn't so much the skills as just the health history. Like this is the first time Anthony Santander's come anywhere close to playing enough to reach the 30 homer threshold. I think if, if he does stay healthy, is, is this, I, I, I refer to it as like the Mike Moustakas profile, a guy who puts the ball in the air so much that even though he doesn't strike out a ton, it's hard for him to deliver a good batting average, mm. but you know he's going to hit enough home runs to make it worthwhile. Um, and that's exactly what Santander has been when he's been able to play enough to uh, to have those the numbers kind of normalize for him, like we saw last year. So I, I think of him as a as a more brittle version of Hunter Renfro, and uh, you know there there's certainly a point when I'd be willing to take him. And he's going decently earlier than Hunter Renfro. I'll look up the cost on Renfro, but right now, uh, Santander, yeah. the ADP is 135 as the 32nd yeah. outfielder. I, I don't really understand that. Like, there seems to be a lot of Renfro skepticism again. I, I mean, uh, I'm, was last year. I'm totally fine with him. I, I've kind of made him the cutoff where I don't want my third outfielder to be worse than him. So, like, yeah. that, that is the cutoff. Like, so yeah, Hunter Renfro, you know, if I can get him as my third outfielder in drafts, totally fine with that. I'm, I'm, and, I'm basically right there with you, yeah. Yeah. Hey, last year, I'm with you, Scott. Now this year, <laughs> with me. Um, Chris, when it comes is to... Is their ADP that different? Uh, let's it's see. only like a round, right? It's like 15 spots? Mm, that might be true. So is he going around 150? Is that it for Renfro right That's now? That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I, mean, yeah, I, I, I guess not that different, but it's weird to me that Santarant Dare would be the one going ahead when yeah, he and, has... And, he's much more brittle. And, it's a profile that I don't love even outside of the injury risk just because it's like it's really home run or nothing like if and home runs are relatively rare events that there tends to be a lot of fluctuation in the total. So like he could stay healthy, have a very similar season next season and hit 27 home runs. And like, that's not a huge number, like a huge difference. It's six home runs, but that's probably, you know, 10 RBI because a lot of his RBI are going to be the result of home runs. And it's just like the, the margin for error with that kind of profile gets really thin for me. So I, it's not a player I, I think I'm going to draft a ton, even if I don't think it's necessarily un, super unlikely that he repeats it. Yeah, the only thing when it comes to Santander is that StatCast does trust the power quite a bit for what it's worth. 90 mile per hour, average exit velocity two years in a row, 11.6% barrel rate. He hit 33 home runs. StatCast said he actually deserved 37 home runs. I have a feeling some of that is because he plays in Camden and yeah his, a lot his of expected home runs yeah. at Camden were the second lowest of any of any park I think it would only have been lower in Pittsburgh which is amazing that that's he, he they have him with 45 in, in Chicago with the White Sox if he was there that's which so is annoying kind of a, a wild gap this yeah. Camden yards thing like pushing back to left field I get why I they it. did it I mean I it. You know, they their pitchers performed a lot better last year okay I guess it but they did that way they, they didn't because their opposing pitchers did too. Like that's that's the, always the thing with like, oh, we're gonna change it. Like the, the Marlins always did this, where like we want to have a home field advantage. It's like the other team pitches there too. You know, that's it's true. not like your well, your yeah, team I, is the I, like you play more of your game. Like, but like there, I just, there is I find a, that whole thing so there silly. is a difference that the Orioles pitchers are bad and don't know how to miss bats, and yet sure. they manage to put up respectable ERAs. So right. I I think I, I think it is a big part of why they exceeded expectations so much and we're in the wild card race basically to the end is that they're very bad pitchers kept were able to keep them in games for the most part uh, but once they get better pitchers like Grayson Rodriguez coming up then you know it it might not matter as much anymore and we'll talk about this when we get to the first base position but someone who's really stood out to me Ryan Mountcastle he had a 15 percent barrel rate last year he crushed the ball and he only had he had something like 20 or 22 home yeah. runs. He was one of the biggest losers in terms of expected home runs last year because obviously he's a right-handed bat that you know pulls a lot of his fly balls and just yeah, the left field one of those, back completely crushed him. That's one of those that I see people on on Twitter like Ryan Mountcastle underlying stats are really good and it's like he's still going to play in that same park. So yeah. I don't see any reason to think that's going to be any different. Unfortunately, like the underlying stats were really impressive last year. He seems to be getting robbed of you know, some pretty impressive numbers, but 
it is what it is. You don't you don't you don't want to point out anybody who last year very loudly made the case for Ryan Mountcastle as a bust. No, I don't no. I don't remember anyone. Oh, oh, I did. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, Chris did. <laughs> yeah, I think I wrote him up yeah. as a bust too, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were all out on, on Mount Castle. Again, it's not, not really his fault that he hit the ball really hard. He did everything he could. But uh, unfortunately, that left field, very um, unforgiving there in Camden Yards. Let's wrap up with a closer here. Ryan Helsley broke out in a big way last year. 74th overall in Roto, 19 saves, 9 wins, a 1-2-5 ERA, a 0.74 whip, 94 strikeouts, over 64 and two-thirds innings pitched. And what changed for him? Fastball velocity up two miles per hour from 2021. Uh, the whiff rate was up on his slider, and he dramatically improved his control once again. Uh, Chris, this one's pretty tough for me because I feel like year over year, there is no more volatility than there is with relief pitchers, and specifically guys who break out and we've only seen do it one year. It's really tough. With that being said, the stuff looks absolutely filthy when it comes to Ryan Helsey. Where are you at on him, Rapido meter this season? Uh, is there any reason to think he won't average, you know, 99.6 miles per hour with this fastball again? Cause it does seem like that's, that's the key distinction there, right? Is he went from being a hard thrower to arguably the hardest thrower in baseball last season. I do have uh, some data on that, or at least uh, a theory that I'm working up. And I've heard other people talk about this as well. So it's not like I came up with this, but no, uh, hit us with the Frank Stample theory, <laughs> Ryan Helsley is he's like one of the max effort pitcher like relievers mm -hmm. in baseball right now and he actually took a, a bunch of time between pitches now we're being introduced with a pitch clock this upcoming season where it's 15 seconds with run uh, with bases empty 20 seconds with runners on base last year helsley averaged 16.9 seconds with bases empty 20.7 seconds with runners on so i just wonder if if he can't give that max effort or if he's just has to pitch a little bit quicker than he has in years past. Like maybe he just won't throw as hard as he did last year. And as a result, the the results won't be as good, but just maybe I'm glad. I, I remember when these rule changes were first announced. Uh, what was it last, last fall or was it even before the end of the season? Yeah. Um, there apparently that wasn't so much of an issue in the minors where they had mm -hmm. been trying it out. It was a concern that maybe this would happen. Uh, pitchers having to throw, take less time in between pitches, losing velocity, but that it evidently wasn't such an issue. I haven't seen the data myself and I can't tell you if I'd interpret it the same way as whoever uh, I, I'm referring to. <laughs> I don't even know who it was, if it was MLB itself or, but the, 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 um, yeah, it does it doesn't? From what I've read, it doesn't sound like that's supposed to be an issue. So. Yeah, I, I I think specifically with Helsley, like look, he threw sixty four innings last season, so there there's a natural amount of volatility with any relief pitcher, especially any relief pitcher whose performance changed so dramatically like his did. But there does seem to be a fairly good explanation for why his performance changed, and so as long as the skill set remains very good, I don't have much reason to doubt it. It's just it's a reliever, you know, Reli relievers are inherently vol volatile. Um, a, a bad month can make a really, a really good reliever look really bad. Look at Josh Hader last season. Although I think he was bad for that stretch of time, but like, it's one of those things that his numbers are probably like, there, there's just an inherent amount of volatility there either way. So it's, it's much, I'm much less likely to invest in a guy like Ryan Helsley who had the one big year breakout, but like, I remember having those same doubts about Liam Hendricks when he had his breakout, and he's been arguably the best reliever in baseball for, like, five years. So you can go wrong that way, too. Yeah. So I, I think if if you're saying, will Brian Helsley repeat a 125 ERA, I would probably not. I would, I would put that at a one because I bet against anybody repeating a 125 ERA. But if we're just – if we're talking about fantasy impact – you know, he had 19 saves last year. And if he's the primary closer from the start of the season, he's going to have more than 19 saves. So he'll, he'll, if he stays healthy, if he gets, you know, at least a 75% save share with the Cardinals uh, who, who still have Giovanni Gallegos, obviously, um, then Ryan Helsley's probably going to be even better for fantasy than he was in 2022. So 
I guess I guess I'd put him at a six overall for uh, repeatability. It just it just depends what number you're talking about. And in terms of those tempo stats, you brought up the name Giovanni Gallegos. He was actually the slowest pitcher, uh, slowest reliever in baseball in terms of between pitches. So he takes a lot of time. Just something to start thinking about. And uh, we'll have a podcast later this week where we go over all the rule changes and and how we think it's going to affect fantasy baseball. Uh, the early ADP for Ryan Helsley, just wanted to ask you guys this. Going just ahead of uh, the ADP, I should mention, is 70. Going just ahead of Kenley Jansen and Camilo Doval right now. Jansen now closing with the Red Sox. Camilo Duvall also now has Taylor Rogers in the mix for the Giants. How would you guys rank those three? Uh, Helsley, Kenley Jansen, and Camilo Duvall. I have Jansen, Helsley, Duvall, but it's, you know, I, they're they're kind of in the same range. I imagine Jansen's early ADP was pulled down from that time he was a free agent. Yeah. And maybe it's it's been climbing since then. Because I, I think he's... You know, just looking at his career, I think he's a, a better bet to get a lot of saves than Helsley is. Um, so yeah, Jansen, Helsley, Duvall. Chris, that sounds right. I haven't gotten to the the portion of my off season where I spend any time thinking about relievers, so that'll <laughs> that'll come in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, let me see over the past couple of weeks how much that ADP has changed, basically since Kenley Jansen has signed, um, and eh, it really hasn't changed all that much. So. Yeah, he's still going just behind Ryan Helsley. So that seems like it's going to be a decision point. If you want to take a closer around that time, you're going to have to decide Ryan Helsley or Kenley Jansen this season. We're going to wrap there. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again later this week. Bye-bye.